seats, if you could find your seats, please. Get water, sorry. Okay, we're back. I hope you were able to uh, take a moment to go out there and check out the lovely, lovely cupcakes. Um, and uh, I'd like to start us off uh, with our afternoon um, special feature event that we always do at the summit on um, the first day. Uh, we, we generally have a hands-on interactive workshop type um, event in the, in the afternoon of the first day. Uh, this year, as I mentioned this morning, um, one of our objectives was to um, engage the librarian community with the instructional design community um, that all uh, work to serve and support um, online practitioners on our campuses. And so we are fortunate um, in, um, in SUNY to have um, uh, you know, a variety of very knowledgeable people, both in OER and, um, uh, uh, and in instructional design, and, um, and to uh, bring them together here today to, um, uh, to do some work together, introduce them to each other, and, and hopefully have some fun. So I am very, very pleased that we also um, are currently um, having some uh, engagement and interaction with Nate Angel. And you may recall that he was with us last year at the summit in Syracuse um, with his um, astute uh, commentary in Twitter on a regular basis. I still remember it from last year. Um, and um, over the last year, we've been um, uh, working together in, in a variety of ways all around the topic of OER. And I'm so very pleased that he was available um, to join us again this year. And I think you're now like an honor honorary SUNY, co open SUNY person. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm hoping you plan to continue to join us um, uh, at the summit uh, next year in Syracuse. Um, so Nate is uh, the doorman at Lumen Learning, and I'm going to let him uh, talk to you um, about uh, what that means and, um, and who he is and what he does. Uh, with him today is Allison Brown from um, uh, SUNY Geneseo, and she is uh, leading the Open SUNY Textbooks um, uh, initiative. And together they um, have put together uh, a, wor a workshop for us, kind of on the, um, you know, playing on, on uh, uh, the notion of having a hackathon together with uh, between the librarians and the and the um, instructional designers that are here today. And so, without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you uh, Nate and Allison. Thank you. Is my uh, volume going uh, through okay? Is that good? So uh, thanks for that, Alex, uh, and thanks for welcoming me. Even though I'm not a SUNY denizen, back for the second year. Um, you may remember my colleague David Wiley uh, spoke to y'all last last year in Syracuse, and thanks also for Allison for um, being willing to join me in what we think is going to be a pretty fun but pretty experimental experience for the rest of the afternoon. So I hope everybody got enough um, cookies and uh, maybe some more caffeine because it may feel a little bit like nap time, but instead we're going to get our hands dirty. And in fact, I'm going to start off because it's uh, heated up a little bit in this room by rolling up my sleeves <laughs> so that we can actually get started. So um, how many people here are familiar with a hackathon idea? Um, half of you, right? So it comes from the technology world and the coding world. And it's the idea that a group of people get together often in the same space, but sometimes, you know, combination with the virtual space and work on something in a kind of focused way for a set amount of time to get some stuff done. Uh, and so we're going to try to use that model of the hackathon here in this room to do that kind of work. But instead of be focusing on code and technology, we're going to focus on information and course design. Um, how many people here don't feel like a uh, librarian or information, uh, uh, instructional designer matches their job title. <laughs> uh, or how about matches what you do on a daily basis? 
So there's, there's a few folks here who don't fit into that category. So we're hoping that there are places that uh, you can intersect in what we're doing here too. Um, I am neither a librarian nor an instructional designer, so if I can participate, so can you. So I'm hoping everybody can. So uh, we're going to um, gonna go through a process today, and we're, we, we started a little bit late, but we think we can accommodate that, so it won't be a problem. But let's just remember that we're going to try something experimental and fun. We're going to try to collaborate on it together. If we don't get as far as we might have hoped, that's okay, because we can actually continue on after we're done here today and, and work on it further. So um, here's what the agenda is going to look like. I'm going to do a little bit of introductory remarks, and then... Allison is going to come up here and kind of um, walk you through the, the first step of this collaborative work we're going to do together and kind of show you an example of that. Um, then we're going to break up into groups for a while and do some, um, some work in groups. We're going to have you sign up in a particular group focused on a certain topic, and you're going to do some work in your group. And then we're going to come back and do some evaluation of that work, some reporting out, some like working through it together to kind of understand what everybody's done, what kind of problems they might have hit, what kind of victories they might have already accomplished. And then we are going to actually put the work that we've done into a form where it can be consumed by the rest of the world. And we're going to do all that and be wrapped up um, by the end of the day today. And so we'll really be able to walk away from this all feeling like we've accomplished something. So you'll notice here on our slides, which I think everybody can see, that there's a link on the bottom to the Hackathon homepage. Uh, that's a web page that we've got up where we have listed out uh, a lot of the resources that we'll be using throughout the day. And I want to encourage everybody to start out by visiting that web page and clicking on the participant survey that's at the very beginning. Now, a couple things that that survey is going to ask you this question that I have up on this slide now. Be very interested to, to hear your answers to that, and you can actually click through and see the results of that yourself of the survey. The other reason that we're doing this survey, um, we have a nefarious reason as well. We want to capture your name and identity, and then we're going to sell it to some used car dealership. No. We're going to use that as a way to set up accounts for you all in a collaborative authoring environment where you'll be able to contribute to um, an open educational resource that can be used by all, all this, all in sundry. Um, and so uh, if you don't want to do that, you don't have to. There's no pressure here. But if you do want to do it, uh, we, we strongly encourage you to do it, and uh, your, your, your identity will not be sold to uh, someone who will, who will do something bad with it. Um, so don't worry about that. So if you do have a device right now, I encourage you to go ahead and, and fill that survey out um, because we actually have a bunch of elves um, working in another state that are going to um, get your account set up while we're um, kind of walking through this first part. So any questions so far? This is going to be pretty interactive, so feel free to raise your hand, although we do need to use the mics uh, for the online audience. Good? Keep going? Okay, so in looking at this question that we have on the screen here now, uh, how many of you feel like you're, that you would check yes to, I'm just learning about open education and OER? Got a couple people. Don't be shy. It's okay. There's no, <laughs> there's no shame, right? So um, I'm going to spend a, just a couple of minutes um, walking through things. And, you know, Allison and I both recognize that given this uh, – you know, congregation of August Company that a lot of you are probably even far better qualified to get up and lead a workshop like this than we are. And so we're kind of preaching to the choir, and a lot of folks have a lot of deep experience in this. And so some of what I'm going to say next may be old news to you, um, but that we want to make sure that everybody's kind of on the same page about what open educational resources are, how open licensing works, at least in its most basic form, so that as we do the rest of this work together today, we'll, we'll have that common understanding. So if you're already uh, well-versed in this, patience, you can take more time filling out the survey. And if you're not, um, this would be a good place to pay attention. So um, the first thing uh, is to be really clear about what we mean by the, this acronym OER that we bandy around a lot, right? So this is Open Educational Resources. What do we mean by that? And, you know, the educational and resources part of that acronym may be sort of self-explanatory with the, the caveat there that resources can mean anything, right? Uh, it could be any uh, material that's used in an educational uh, kind of endeavor, 
Um, so it's not only textbooks, right? A lot of people have this idea that OER is really just about textbooks, and it's not only about textbooks. It can be about the components of textbooks, or it can be about completely other kinds of um, learning materials that are, that are brought into that context. But the more important nuance here is what do we really mean when we say open? Uh, and there's a lot of um, confusion, especially around people who are just dipping into this, that there's some sort of um, uh, equivalence between free and open, as in no cost and open. And that's actually a very important distinction uh, to keep in mind, because just because something doesn't cost money, it doesn't mean that you have all the benefits that a truly open resource would give you in order to take, uh, to take that resource and do all the things that you might want to do with it as an educator, as a student. And so that open distinction is, um, is very crucial to our understanding of what open means and as a kind of uh, a way of uh, further formalizing this definition, we reach toward this idea of the five R benefits that a truly open resource can, can give you. And we'll talk about those a little bit more as we go forward, but that's a way to kind of measure the degree to which something is really giving you an open benefit or not. So I'm gonna start out with this question. So can anyone tell me, and remember we need to use our mics, what these two images have in common? And it's no fair if you've heard this before. Someone who hasn't heard it before, because it's a joke. Any ideas? Shout them out and I'll repeat it. What's that? They're both, they show avatars? Copyright. Copyright, who said that? Aha, you're onto something there. Anything else? Any other similarities? A lot of people mention that there's a color similarity. There's some blue in it, right? So the one on the, on the left is like a child's drawing hung on your refrigerator, right? And the one on the right is a poster for a major Hollywood film and they have a lot of things in common in terms of being graphic images, but copyright is actually the key point here. Both of these works are fully protected by US copyright law as soon as they are published. They don't, not, nobody needs to apply for copyright. Re copyright doesn't need to be recorded anywhere, right? As soon as an image like this, like the refrigerator drawing is posted, it is copyrighted and fully protected under the law uh, and licensed to its creator. And so copyright law is a very strong uh, kind of US set of laws that does a lot of great things in order uh, to give creators the ability to collect rewards for the kind of work that they do, right? Um, unfortunately, copyright also puts a lot of barriers uh, on the user in order to what they can actually do with those works. Um, and so when we think about what we do as educators, uh, a lot of what we do is really revolves around the idea of sharing things, right? Whether it's sharing uh, materials, sharing experiences, sharing knowledge, sharing understanding, sharing time. Uh, and uh, as we, we think about these things that we share, um, copyright is actually kind of works against that desire in all of us to share as educators. Uh, and so when we think about uh, what we actually share, when I uh, share an idea like the one I just shared with you, right, I, I, it doesn't matter if somebody else already thought of that, I'm, I'm free to express and share that idea, but what's protected under copyright is the physical expression of that idea, right? If that idea m is manifested in some sort of tangible way, uh, then that tangible object becomes copyrighted, like the drawing on the refrigerator. And so um, we deal in ideas, but we also need to transmit those ideas in tangible form, right? So the, these, uh, these kinds, of, um, kinds of expressions are sort of a little bit at odds with each other. So in one hand, uh, you have a tangible expression of an idea or content in the form of a newspaper, and no matter how many different copies of that are printed, right, we can all each hold one by ourselves at a single time. I mean, you might look over the, my shoulder and read the sports page along with me, but if I'm really gonna give it to you, I have to give you that physical object and then I don't have it anymore. <clears throat> at the same time, we now live in a world where a lot of us don't even necessarily consume most of our information that way, right? We live in a world where the internet exists and the internet 
um, gives us the ability to access information in a way that allows each of us to consume it without necessarily taking it away physically from somebody else. So millions of us can be reading the CNN homepage at the same time without blocking anybody else. And so there's this tension not only between copyright and education, but also between copyright and the electronic digital environment, the networked world that we live in today with the internet, right? Where the internet is promoting the easy sharing of content and the and copyright is actually trying to put restrictions on that so it can be controlled and, and harnessed. So there's these two tensions that we live out as, um, as, as educators every day. So this enters um, the world where uh, folks tried to come up with a way in order to resolve some of these tensions um, where copyright law exists and knowledge needs to be shared. How many people here have heard of Creative Commons? I'm gonna assume it's pretty much unanimous, right? Right, so cr the thing that I didn't understand about Creative Commons until relatively recently is that Creative Commons is not uh, something that stands in opposition to copyright. Creative Commons is an organization that is using the power of copyright law in order to help enforce sharing, right? So it's taking the power of copyright and letting you use it as a copyright holder to explicitly grant permissions for what you would like to see shared in your work. So it's using copyright to promote sharing. It's not against copyright. So that, and that brings us back to the five R's. There's a whole variety of different Creative Commons licenses, and we're not going to go into a lot of depth about them here, but we're just going to just glance at them. But I want to come back to this idea of the five R's. So there, there's a variety of different kinds of open licenses that could exist, but if the open license isn't giving you all the benefits of the five R's here, uh, retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute, then it isn't really a fully open work. And so as we go through the rest of the day processing and discovering uh, different f forms of information, we're going to be looking at each one of them and say, does this piece of information, is it licensed in such a way that it gives me the five R benefits as an educator, right? So, and this is just to kind of introduce you to these ideas. This isn't the, as we work through uh, specific examples, we'll be touching on these more. And so, uh, you know, there's a variety of different Creative Commons licenses. I'm assuming a lot of people here have encountered them before. Um, you know, the main ones are about attribution, so who is the author or copyright holder of this work, and then you need to credit them. It's a lot like footnotes, right? Um, is the work uh, allowed to be used in commercial environments or commercial circumstances? Um, if I share the work again or share um, my modifications to the work, do I have to keep the same licensing or am I allowed to mix it with other kinds of licensing? And so those are some of the main different kinds of components that Creative Commons licensing can do. And when you, th when you think about these different licenses and the order of the degree of openness that they afford or the degree of friction that they impose on users, um, you can kind of stack them this way with the licenses that impose the least friction on the top and as you start to add more and more of those little circles and those little initials and stuff, you, what you're basically doing is adding friction around the usages and benefits that you're giving users with the work or that you get to, you get to drive as a user um, to the point where you even have things like you can use this, but you can't change it in any way. And so like the default Creative Commons license for all the TED Talks, how many people here use TED Talks in their work? Quite a few of us, right? Well, unfortunately, the default Creative Commons license for TED Talks includes a non-derivative clause. I think they want to protect them from being used out of context and being chopped up and kind of re-sliced that way. But that also means that uh, if Ginger wants to make a, uh, a textual equivalent of a TED Talk, she actually has to ask for permission because she's making a derivative work from it. So they usually freely grant those, but there's something about their licensing that's added a little bit of extra friction there. So this is just put up to scare you um, because I'm not going to walk through each one of these uh, cells in this matrix at the same time. Um, this is actually available on the Creative Commons website, and you'll see on that website up there that our slides are already available so you can get to all this stuff all you want. But you can see this is a, a matrix, right, that just has all the Creative Commons listed down in rows and across in columns. And you can see if you're trying to bring works together from various sources, there are certain circumstances where that's not really legal, right? You can do it but it's not legal. Uh, and so uh, you, you can see that the fewer restrictions are on something, the more freedom that we have as users in order to um, 
to make use of it. So when we, when we think about uh, what you want to do with your own work, a lot of people are attracted to adding things like non-commercial and um, share alike onto their Creative Commons licenses. Um, I would encourage everybody, and I myself practice, uh, and actually Lumen Learning as a company practices, the idea that we put the least restrictive license we can on it, everything that still includes attribution so that everybody understands where something came from. And we do this not because um, we uh, have some sort of like um, super um, – philosophical uh, mandate in order to do it, but um, because we want to encourage the widest use of learning resources possible in the world. At the same time, we know that the work that we're doing stands on the shoulders of a lot of work that a lot of other people did, and so it behooves us to give back to that commons and contribute things back to that world. So that's, that's our pitch for why we use the, um, the buy um, the Creative Commons attribution license. So uh, I'm just about to end there. It's a very brief introduction. Allison is going to um, step up here and lead you through uh, the rest of the day, what it's going to look like. I want to encourage you now. Is there anybody who hasn't already gone and filled out the survey or at least made the decision that they don't want to? It's fine if you've decided not to. So this, uh, the URL at the bottom of the slide up there that says lumenlearning.com slash OST, if you go to that page, there's a link to the survey there. All right, so um, I, the thing that's on the screen now is more for your pleasure at another time, but it's a game that you can play um, in order to test your ability to remix Creative Commons licenses legally. Uh, yeah, it's a little bit of a head scratcher, so uh, it might be the kind of thing that you want to do later tonight over drinks or something. Um, we're not going to go into it now, and instead, we're going to leap to actual tangible work uh, that we're going to do here in the room together. So I'm going to bring Allison up. A little bit shorter. Hello. Um, so in case any of you are out of the room when Alex introduced me earlier, my name is Allison Brown, um, and I come here from SUNY Geneseo. Um, I'm the digital publishing services manager there, and I work out of the library. Um, and one of the main uh, projects that I work on, as Alex mentioned, is the Open SUNY Textbook Project. So that's where a lot of my experience with OER comes from. Um, and in case you don't know a lot about um, Open SUNY Textbooks, I'm just going to give a really brief introduction of uh, what it is and then um, some of our next steps before we move into the, um, the activity. Um, so we um, began in 2012 as an IATG grant-funded project, um, working with faculty um, across SUNY to author open textbooks, um, and also working with libraries across SUNY to, um, to develop support um, for those authors that are working on developing open content. Um, so far, we have published um, 13 textbooks um, available at our website. Um, and we have, I think, 10 or 12 more in the works. And um, what is unique about our project is that um, unlike a lot of other t open textbook projects, um, our, we, our, uh, the range spans um, lower level and higher level books. So um, whereas a lot of open textbook initiatives target um, introductory level courses, we have a really nice range and a really nice variety of our, uh, of our content. Um, so, um, and as this project has um, expanded, it's been really exciting because um, we've just grown um, more and more connected with the SUNY community and the SUNY open community. Um, and so it's really helped us think about moving forward and what we want to be doing and supporting in the next um, step. Um, so thinking about moving forward, the first thing that we're thinking about is creating this sustainable model, kind of echoing back to um, what Kim was talking about earlier, um, and making sure that we have a plan for moving forward um, in, in these support activities. And then the second thing we want to do is um, target the core services that we um, have developed over the last few years um, and, and really work on developing those and offering those more widely. Um, so the first one is going to be the technical infrastructure that um, enables creation and distribution and delivery of OER material, um, and then editorial support that will um, 
offer some editing and peer review services to really maintain the quality um, of OER. And then lastly, um, to really continue to engage with the community and um, leverage that community and um, collaborative um, activities just like we're going to be doing today. Um, and all of that to support not only the creation of open textbooks, but um, the creation of general OER, the adoption of OER, um, and lots of remixing projects that could be anywhere on the scale in between adoption and creation. Um, so I give you that background a little bit today um, to tell you, again, where I'm coming from. And also, um, because the project that we're doing today is really the type of project that we are, are excited about um, engaging with and supporting. Um, so Nate had um, warned you that today was going to be a little experimental, and I want to go into a little bit more detail about what exactly our mission today is going to be. Um, so um, what we thought is that we would start with an existing OER and work together um, to augment it and to find other OER resources that might add to it and really customize it for your community. Um, and the OER that we chose is the Information Literacy Users Guide. And if you um, are a librarian or if you work with librarians, you may already be familiar with this resource. Do we have anyone that has seen it or used it? Awesome. Awesome. Great. Um, and so we picked this um, particular resource um, first because um, it's, we think, a really important topic um, and a topic that um, spans disciplines. So hopefully everyone um, here can um, apply this in multiple places that they teach or um, multiple places where they support teaching. Um, and just as a topic in general, um, I feel like it's a really important topic in higher education and in online learning especially. Um, so, I just want to give you a little preview of uh, what our, our end product is going to look like to get you, give you a little visual. And if you um, went to the main um, site, you may have already discovered it. Can you see that? Sorry about this. Should have adjusted my display size earlier. Fill this. Awesome. Thank you. All right, so then, so this is going to be our jumping off point, and um, what we've, um, what Nate has done, actually, is create a copy of the original OER um, for us to play with and change and add to. Um, and so we've called it the collaborative edition, because it's hopefully going to be a completely new edition and a completely new thing at the end of today. Um, so you can see it's, um, it's divided up into sections here, um, and this is based on an information literacy framework, and I um, believe there's some in information in the introduction about the framework that it's based on if you are interested. Um, and the idea is that each, um, that will split up into groups, and each group will focus on a different um, pillar, a different section, chapter, module, whatever you want to call it, um, and look at the learning objectives within that chapter, and go out and um, discover some OER material to bring back into this, into this resource. Um, so I, oh, I'm not. I started with um, the gather section, and I have added a video tutorial into the OER. So you can see that I've added some, some extra kind of ancillary materials there. So the other reason that this is a really great um, resource to use as a jumping off point, like I said earlier, it's based on um, the, uh, the info literacy framework. Um, and because, um, because it's based on that framework, it comes ready-made with lots of great learning objectives for us. Um, and so we'll be able to use those as our jumping off point as we move forward. Um, so I'm just going to take a few minutes um, 
now to uh, to walk through some discovery and walk through some approaches for discovery, um, and then we will start um, getting together in our groups and doing our discovery process. So you guys are, I'm sure, very familiar with the backwards design process and, um, and using those learning objectives um, to build the, the structure of a course and to really um, find content that will help um, learners um, reach those goals, right? And so we want to use that process as we move forward building um, an OER together. So, um, so when you think about starting to search for OER, think about those learning objectives to begin with. And um, in a lot of cases, those learning objectives are going to be great places to start literally searching with those learning objectives. Um, so I encourage you um, to try that. So when I was doing my example, I chose a learning objective that was a little bit harder um, to search. So I had chosen how libraries um, provide access to resources, which are all kind of vague search terms to use. Um, so I had to do a little bit of brainstorming and a little bit of um, digging to get to some keywords that got some good results for me. Um, and I do, since this um, book, since this OER is about um, research and good searching practices. If you feel like you don't have a lot of um, knowledge in that area, I encourage you to go to the plan chapter in um, this OER and you can find a lot of good um, searching strategies and, um, and some good um, ways of brainstorming keywords if you, um, if you feel like you need some more background information on that. And this is just a preview of one of the tools that is highlighted in the uh, plan section. So um, just to highlight a different, a few of the different um, types of places we might search for OER. And one of the first places that you might know of is Merlot. And it, this is a great resource and it contains so many good um, so many good resources for us to use. And it may actually be a really good place for us to search today because we may want to find some smaller modularized content um, to bring into our OER. Um, but I did want to highlight this um, advanced search page. And if you look at the very bottom here, this is where you'll find the Creative Commons filter there. Um, and also just keep in mind that Merlot is a really big um, repository. And so if you don't have a really um, good plan of attack for your searching, it may not be the best place to start. So just um, keep in mind those pros and cons as you choose a place to start your search. Um, if you are looking for multimedia, the Creative Commons search is actually a good, um, a good tool for that. And I had used that to discover my video content and my tutorial content because I come from the library community and I know that librarians like to make tutorials and make very good tutorials. Um, and so I also wanted to highlight um, the Creative Commons search here. So, um, but with both of these searches and with any search, especially when you're thinking about OER and you're thinking about evaluating the license, I just want to caution you to um, make sure that you're double checking um, your license to make sure that um, even though you, you, you apply that filter, that the content that you um, eventually get to does fall within the Creative Commons license that you're looking for. Um, and so just to model that, So you can see once I've done my search, you can, um, once you know that you can just put Creative Commons in the search bar, you can go um, start straight from YouTube. But um, a couple ways, and I don't know if, um, you can double check that license, is um, using that little show more to check the license there. And I usually try um, to look at the user that's uploaded the, um, the content and um, also to see if the content itself is marked with the same Creative Commons license. Um, because just like, um, like Merlot and YouTube are both user um, submitted um, repositories and so we want to be really um, um, aware of the fact that uh, someone may upload something and mark it in a way that is not correct. So we want to be doing our due diligence and making sure that we're double checking those places. So double checking that user and double checking the marking on the video. And on the video I did end up um, adding, I could find that ending um, slide that the library had added that had marked it um, with Creative Commons license. Um, 
But there are a few different types of places that we can search. So um, I'm highlighting the open textbook um, library um, as an example of one place that offers more um, structured and more curated content. So the open textbook library has a minimum Creative Commons um, a minimum Creative Commons requirement. So when I'm going to that um, site, I know that that content already fulfills that part of my, um, my OER criteria. And the other thing that's great about sites like this is that they're easily browsable. And if you know what subject you're looking at, um, you'll be able to discover really easily whether it has something that um, fits your needs. So in this case, um, I was looking in the um, like the English and writing area, and I was also looking in um, like the general education area because I knew that both of those subjects would address research and evaluating sources and plagiarism and other topics that fall under information literacy. And the last strategy that I wanted to highlight is thinking close to home and thinking about what content you already have and already may have authored um, and have access to, um, to build upon and to include, um, not just in today's um, project, but um, just in general when you're thinking about OER creation. So I know that um, the Coke community has a lot of OER resources already created and at their fingertips. And um, the resources for the online course support librarians is one example of that. And I'm, I've come across a few different um, few different examples too of, of um, people that I think are in this room as well. So, so I encourage you to kind of think about um, those places where you can uh, um, discover content. So um, the other thing I just wanted to show you to build upon that um, backwards design and building upon our learning objectives, um, a collaborative tool that, again, Nate has kindly put together for us to use as we um, do our discovery and as we record the, um, the OER resources that we are thinking about including in this project. Um, so I can see a lot of you are already in this spreadsheet. It's called the hands-on OER Hackathon Discovery Worksheet. And you can see that um, we've pre-populated them with the learning outcomes that are associated with um, that chapter. Um, and each chapter has its own sheet at the bottom there. Um, so as you find um, resources that, um, that fulfill that learning objective, use this form um, to record them and share them with your group. Um, and it will also <coughs> um, help you just keep track of um, where that resource lives. Um, and the licenses so that when we come back to do evaluation, um, we can we have all the information that we need right there. Am I missing anything? Well, so um, what I was thinking is, given that it's about 3.10 and that you were promised another break at 3.15, that we would combine the activity of breaking into groups with the, the activity of taking a break. <laughs> so just so you know, again, that home page that is on um, all the slides, uh, at the foot of all the slides. Oops. <clears throat> so that link up there, Lumen Learning slash OSD, which stands for Open SUNY Textbooks, um, has a link to um, all the resources that we're going to use today, including that worksheet <laughs> that Allison was just showing off. So what we've got scattered around the room now is these easels, and then up here on the white um, the whiteboards on the back of us is we have a um, description of each of the chapters in this information literacy user's guide. And so your job as you run out to get more drinks or go to the bathroom or whatever you're going to do during the break, make a phone call, tweet to get your badges, right? I hope that everybody noticed that I did get a post up on Plurk, so Alex got her wish. If you don't know what Plurk is, you don't need to know. Um, so on your way out, uh, take a, a walk around and examine uh, the different chapters, or you can look at them online because the, the collaborative edition of the InfoLit Guide is also linked from that web page. Decide which chapter calls out to you to collaborate on today, and then we want you to sign your name up on whatever whiteboard has that chapter's description on it. So then, when you come back from break, you're going to divide into the groups based on chapter, and you're going to work collaboratively on doing discovery around finding OER that meets some of the learning objectives, could even be one of the learning objectives. Maybe you only find one good piece of open educational resource. That's fine. 
Um, if you find more than one for one learning objective, feel free to just duplicate that learning objective and make a new record in the spreadsheet. That's fine also. Um, so when you come back, uh, we'll, we will have assigned, uh, try to congregate near the um, easel where you've signed up on your name. And that's where that collaborative group will kind of do your work. So you may need to shift your seats around a little bit, which I know is super uncomfortable. Um, so what we're gonna do is break apart now we're going to get back together at 3.30, congregating into the groups, and Allison and I are going to buzz around and help e any group that's trying to get started. And at this point, we're really focused on the discovery aspect, right? Finding OER activities, videos, additional resources that meet the learning objectives. Now, there's only one other thing to say, maybe, and that's that there are a couple of chapters in the book that we consider to be sort of advanced topics, if you will. So there, there are the seven pillars of information literacy scattered around, and then there are uh, a chapter on science literacy, on visual literacy, and uh, the super meta topic of instructor resources for the teaching of information literacy, which is like several different you know, mirrors facing each other, I believe. So if you feel like you want to delve into any of those advanced topics, those, those topics are over here under advanced. So break up, we'll gather back at 3.30 and we will begin our group work. Anything else? Okay. Awesome. Yeah, oh, no, it's really wow. Everybody wants the advanced topic. <laughs> All right, folks, if you, everybody want to start uh, coming back to the room, we're going to uh, change where you're sitting now. We were told that we have to do a better job of speaking into the mic. All right, I'm going to just run out to the cupcake stand and make sure there's nobody lollygagging. Okay, so uh, presumably everybody who's willing to sign their name on the dotted line has already done so. And we're starting to see some patterns here in terms of uh, clusters of folks that want to do stuff. And so here's what we're going to, um, here's how we're going to kind of arrange people. Um, poor Madeline is the only uh, person to have signed up. Who's, oh, it's Madeline over there. Okay. So Madeline, we're going to ask you to come over. Yay, Madeline, a round of applause for Madeline. So Madeline, and anybody else who's signed up under present or manage, we're going to center that work over here. So if you've signed up for identify, present, or manage, if you would kind of congregate over in this space so you can do a little bit of face-to-face -face work with those folks. If you have picked one of the advanced topics, and I know that you picked it because you're already sitting over here. No, I'm just kidding. Can you congregate kind of over here in the front? If you've got evaluate, we have a little cluster back there in the corner. And then gather, obviously, steer toward the handlebar mustache in the corner. All right, so we're going to have four main clusters, the advanced topics, five, sorry, advanced topics, evaluate, gather, and then the larger group here of, uh, of the other three. So we'll give you just a few seconds to gather your things and move around a little bit. Um, Sorry, I know you've gotten very comfortable in your space and everybody likes to sit in the same spot throughout class, right? Nathan? Na Nathan? Nathan? We are confused on what we are doing right now. Can you please let us know yeah. because we were talking and not paying attention. <laughs> Oh, that's it. No badge for you. No, just kidding. So what we're doing right now is making sure that you're sitting in the right area. Yes. So if you are part of the gather area, then you, are, you have done what the, you were supposed to do. And then the next step is what we're going to talk about here as soon as everybody uh, is sitting down. <laughs> I know, we're real stern taskmasters here. Hey, well, I think we're doing pretty good considering the uh, the timing of all this. So, moving people around is a difficult thing to do. That's why uh, we're all in the army, right? If you advance, folks, or too large, you can kind of spread out this way a little bit more. I 
Okay, so here's, here's a brief reminder on what the next steps are going to be for this next 30 minutes of activity, right? So this is going to be the time when you're working with your fellow uh, practitioners in the chapter or topic area that you've decided to take on to work to discover new, new OER materials that aren't already in this work so that you can enrich it and add them to it, right? That's your goal. And you want to discover things that are aligned to learning outcomes that are actually covered in the textbook as opposed to something that's not covered in the textbook, right? So this is one of the key things of backward center design, right, is that we try to meet the learning outcomes that are in the, in the course itself. So you're already situated in your group, and you have gone to the web page uh, at lumenlearning.com slash OST so that you can find the worksheet that I'm showing on the screen right now. Is there anybody who doesn't have access to that worksheet? Great, so everybody found it. So on the bottom of that worksheet, you're going to see a bunch of tabs, right? This is a Google worksheet. And each one of those tabs is either an example that shows you how you might fill out such a worksheet, a list of broad OER resources like the kind that Allison was showing in the beginning that she was working from that you can use as uh, places to start your discovery process, or a tab that's named after the chapter that you've decided to work on. So your goal for the next 30 minutes is to work within your group to identify some, discover and identify some good OER that's related to specific learning outcomes in your chapter. So you're going to want to go to the tab about your chapter. And you'll see here that the folks in Gather are already hard at work, right? They have picked certain learning outcomes and gone out, done some discovery, and identified what they believe is some valuable OER aligned to those learning outcomes and put a way to find it again into the spreadsheet so that we can get back to it and evaluate it and think about it and maybe bring it into the work uh, as a later step in the workshop, right? So your goal is to take on one of these learning outcomes. You can duplicate them and make new rows if you want and identify some good OER to go with it. Does anybody have any questions about that? Don't be shy. Okay, we're going to bop around now, and if anybody has a specific question we can help with, then we're happy to do it. There's going to be in-group fighting, I can feel it. Watching this spreadsheet as you've been going along, and it looks like it's filling up with really awesome stuff. So we could continue to do this for the rest of our lives probably, right? But um, let's uh, take a pause now and actually move to what we think of as the evaluation phase. So what we're going to ask you to do as a group is pick at least one resource and elect a spokesperson. And we're going to ask you to talk to the rest of us about how you found that resource, and then we're going to walk through a kind of evaluation process of it together as a group. And in order to do that, we're going to refer to a kind of rubric or a list of um, kind of concepts that one would use to evaluate an OER work. And that list is located uh, conveniently in the additional resources of the Info Literacy User's Guide itself. So I'm going to navigate over to that. So while I navigate to that, quickly decide which resource you want to start with and elect your spokesperson. Okay? And if there's only one of you in the group, like Madeline, I guess you get to be your own spokesperson. <laughs> Unless you've joined another group, then. Okay, and so we're going to go in the order of the way the books are presented, I mean the chapters are presented in the Info Literacy User's Guide itself. And because the early chapters didn't get any sign-ups, that means Gather is actually the first group to go. So has Gather elected a spokesperson? Spokeswoman, ideal. And have you picked the resource that you want to share? 
Okay, so why don't you make sure that your mic is on so that you can talk to us. And then I'm going to go, I'm going to navigate over to the gather tab in the spreadsheet and then you let us know which resource that you um, want to talk to us about. And you'll see up here on the screens, although are they turned off on this side? And we can see it here. Okay, you can see one of them. So um, you can see that there's this page in the additional resources of the Info Literacy Users Guide that has this OER rubric. And so we're going to walk through as a group kind of evaluating this resource that you found based on uh, some of these concepts, okay? Okay. <laughs> check, sound check done. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to navigate to the tab and you can start talking about the resource and I'll find it. All right. Oh, stop. I'm sure. <laughs> All right, uh, so we had gather and our learning outcome that we went with, which is on row 13, is use a range of retrieval tools and resources, and I can't read the rest of it because I'm on an iPad, which was very bad for this activity, here, 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 here. effectively. Yes. So the thing that we found was a video called Scholarly versus Popular Periodicals. And we found this by going to Merlot and searching for information literacy and then restricting the search to only Creative Commons licensed things. And here is what we found. Was that what I was supposed to do? Great. And is that the video? That's it. That's yes. it. Okay. So um, the first question in the rubric, let me get it uh, so I can flip to back and forth really easily. If I stand a ways back, is that still working in terms of sound? No, we can't do okay. it. Mm -hmm. They were saying that it wasn't carrying well enough, but. Okay. So presumably, as you guys were um, looking for this resource, uh, you found it to be relevant to the learning outcome that you were working with, right? S sort of. <laughs> okay, you want to talk about we, that? We stretched what we thought the learning outcome meant because it wasn't exactly what it was, but it says, uh, and again, I can't read the whole thing. I, I could read it for you if you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Re it, we felt that it meant resource a range of resources effectively, so you'd need to know the differences in the resources. So we felt that uh, knowing the difference between scholarly and uh, I can't rem popular. and popular periodicals uh, would meet that. So uh, we also invite other folks from the from the group to comment on things as we go along through these. So uh, there's definitely some re relevance there, and we're assuming that in your discovery processes that you were focused on relevance. Um, what about licensing? Let's go to the next point in this, this sort of rubric here. According uh, to Merlot, it is CC by share alike, no derivatives, I believe. And so Allison has kind of a technique for um, deciding if Merlot is speaking the truth or not, don't you? Oh, I don't know that technique. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to have to kind of see if I can find it um, in Merlot. But um, so it'll, it's a similar, just double checks to what I was talking about earlier with YouTube, um, looking at who the uh, submitter was to see if it's the same as the user. Um, that's a really good indication because if the creator has submitted it, we assume that they've marked it correctly. Um, is that what you were thinking of? Yeah. Yeah. And then we can also look um, through to the end of the video to see if they've marked it at all to double check there. Um, and it doesn't look like they have, but it has noted a name, like a person that has uh, made it, and we can um, check that also against um, the author that's listed in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in Merlot. Right, the idea being, of course, that if the ostensible author of the work was the one who submitted it to Merlot and indicated the license there, then as the copyright holder, they have the right to issue it under that license, right? 
if I, Nate, go and submit somebody else's video to Merlot with a certain license, I don't really have the right to, to attach that license to it. So this is the kind of trickiness that one gets into in evaluating the license of OER sometimes when it's not clearly stated. Because that video doesn't necess does it carry anywhere in the video itself an open license marker? Not that I'm aware of. It is a Merlot classic, if that counts as anything. I don't know what that means. It means it has a special sticker next to the, the resource. Hey, I've got two uh, <laughs> summit badges. <laughs> that which I think are worth way more than a Merlot special sticker, by the way. Yeah, so what I, what I can tell is that the user is not the same as the submitter. It's not, yeah, but I, see the that. Submitter I see that as well. <laughs> has um, recorded the um, the author correctly so we we know that they've you know at least done that correctly but since we can't see it on the actual tutorial that makes it a little harder to tell so I, th I think in the end we have to give this one a sort of provisional hmm not sure um, so again this is part of the reason why Creative Commons exists right so that authors who want to share can do so simply and make a clear indication that they want to do that by attaching a clear uh, Creative Commons license to their work. Uh, and so not every work might meet that standard. That doesn't mean it's, it's not okay, but it's uh, often worth reaching out to the author directly and seeing uh, if they, they uh, are willing to attach or attest to the fact that it has the right licensing in Merlot. Um, what about... The accuracy of it. Did you did you feel that this work, uh, you know, was uh, would have been useful in, in meeting the needs of uh, of students who are working toward achieving that learning outcome? I felt so, yes, and it was also short, so we liked that about it as well, and had nice production quality. Well, decent production quality. Decent production quality, and I'll just note there though that um, that by focusing on when you said it was short. So the license recorded in Merlot was um, included a non-derivatives clause, it looks like. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a key point, right? Because uh, with such a license, that means that you actually aren't given permission to make a shorter version of it, right? No, so let's say you've got a really long video and you really only want a minute or three minutes of it. If it has an ND license in it, you don't automatically have the right to make that, that edit. Um, you know, some, some systems that allow you to embed videos give you the ability to start the video in a certain place, um, but you can, that doesn't mean that you're modifying it if you just kind of encourage people to start watching in a certain place. Um, but that's another friction that exists, right, with an ND, an ND license. Okay. What about, uh, I saw that you noted in your notes that um, there was an accessibility issue. Do you want to talk about that? I couldn't view it on my iPad, so I had to get Cherie to put it on her computer because you need Java. And there are no captions. So maybe, uh, so maybe this is not a good resource after all. <laughs> I wish I had this rubric before I was looking at the resources. That would have helped. No, but that wouldn't have been any fun, right? You wouldn't want to give your students the great Yes, you always give them the rubric before they do the assignment. <laughs> The rubric is pointless otherwise. Well, it's still a good rubric, but. <laughs> nice. Okay, well, we actually thought it would be fun to have some counterexamples come out in discussion here. So, um, very well done. Um, do you feel, was there any interactivity built into the, uh, into the work? Well, you had to press play. <laughs> no, you didn't. Oh. <laughs> it started automatically. Oh, never mind. No, I did not feel like there was an interactive Well, it, it is, it is a video rather than text. Yeah, is... so, yeah, you don't have to read anything, so that's good sometimes. Okay, well, a good uh, and possibly useful and instructive example. All right, so our next group then would be... Oh. And we're only moving around from group to group uh, because we uh, did a time limitation, so we're kind of hitting just one item from each group, right? So we're going to move to evaluate. Have you guys elected a spokesperson? <laughs> oh, you left the room and then they elected you spokesperson. There you go. Nice. Yeah. Uh, well, we'll see. We will see. So 
so me which, through this um, so I miss the, right, so the steps. Okay. Which, uh, which work are you focused on presenting to us? It is evaluate a web page practice found through the OER Commons. And we liked it because it was interactive, provided tutorial, provided a checklist that you could download. I will point out that I didn't get that middle portion of content on my iPad. Jace and Chris found it for me on the Mac, so um, that's a potential issue. <coughs> Okay, and I've, um, I've looked at these resources before in particular, um, so I'm kind of familiar with them. So you found the, rel the relevance to be high, right, related mm -hmm. to the learning outcome. Um, what about the licensing? The licensing was clearly on the website. It, um, it's called custom permissions. Sorry? Oh, I'm sorry. Looking down at my notes. Custom permissions, which allowed use if you um, cite their, their website, you know, provided a link to their website, you can share it, but not remix, repurpose. Just read only, basically. Right, and so this, um, this nonprofit organization has published what is probably the, I would say the best free resource for using, especially Microsoft Office tools, um, which is kind of nice because who wants to spend a bunch of money creating free resources for a proprietary software? Um, but because they themselves offer courses for pay um, based around these materials, they have a somewhat restrictive license over them. And so this, this puts them into a situation that's a little bit like the most restrictive open license, like you can use it, but you can't really do anything else in it. So like you said, read only. Um, and so this kind of puts us into the situation of that kind of Lincoln embed mode, right? If they provide a capability that allows you to embed it, you can do so like YouTube does, um, unless that's turned off for that mm. particular video. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, they don't, and so really linking to it is your only option. So what you have here essentially ends up being a free resource that you can link to, and it's a pretty high quality, um, but you have no other control over it. So for instance, if you wanted to edit it or change it no, or anything like that. So it's, um, it's, it's definitely meets uh, a certain level of utility in its licensing. The what about? The what other about the um, oh, sorry, interesting um, piece to it is that there's a bit of interactivity built in that you can um, use it as, you know, quizzing tool and, um, and, and check. And I went to actually use it to check their website, so I didn't have enough time, but to you, so you have a guide now to go evaluate other websites, a, a practical application, I would say. So would that be a kind of formative practice kind mm -hmm. of interactivity as opposed to some sort of summative gradebook right. oriented right. activity? Right. Gotcha. Applying what you've learned. And mm -hmm. uh, the production quality seems pretty high on this site. Mm -hmm. um, what about uh, accessibility concerns? Did you uncover any accessibility concerns? We, we didn't see that, right? I mean, they say on their website they're Section 508 compliant, but then Deb can get her on her iPad, so. I don't know. I mean, I suppose you could be, I don't know, can you be Section 508 compliant if you if it's not accessible on an iPad? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to ask Apple about that, right? <laughs> Any accessibility experts in the room want to comment on that? Yeah. Right, eventually it may be an issue. I mean, the, the, the motivation that we have always at Lumen for um, creating accessible works is that if you uh, design something that's accessible for the broadest number of users, then it also, um, those benefits accrue to all users, right? So designing something meeting uh, full accessibility guidelines can make it easier to use on multiple devices, for example, right? So it's good practices not just for accessibility but for usability in general. Great, okay, so anything else that you guys wanted to talk about that particular resource? Yes, collectively we said it was very difficult finding sites or websites to match the learning outcomes. In other words, digging deep into Merlot, OER was better, but even um, 
the process was very time consuming, which is what you hear about OER. It takes a lot of time to find good resources. Uh, tagging helped as well, the tagging on the OER Commons site. That was very um, valuable. Okay, great. So our next group then. Oh, sorry, question. go ahead. I have a question about accessibilities and specifically why it doesn't work on an iPad. Um, do you really have to design everything where your design is held hostage by a company that decides not to support <laughs> something like an iPad and Flash? <laughs> um, like the most used. You can't. Uh, any company then could say, I'm going to make a device and I'm not going to support that. And if somebody who needs the accessibility happens to purchase that device, then all of a sudden what was made in the past is now a violation because a company later on down the line decides not to support something? I could that, answer that, but sketchy. I bet someone else might answer it better. But you have to use a mic if you can answer. <laughs> no? There we go. Well, I, I used to own a business, and we built uh, um, all sorts of interactive products. And, you know, it's, it's whether it's a government regulation to be accessible or not, it just makes sense to, to try to not alienate huge chunks of the public. So whatever you can do to make your, uh, your resources more accessible, uh, it, it, that's just common sense. But, yeah, it's always a nightmare because you've got Bill Gates, uh, arguing against the ghost of Steve Jobs and, you know, and uh, it, it's always a challenge. But, you know, I mean, it used to be we were designing for uh, 800 by 600 screens and everybody got their factory shipped monitors set at 420. So, <laughs> I, I mean, I'm going back to the 90s here, but, you know, it's it's been a problem forever. Yeah, I mean, certainly accessibility is it's a moving target. It's not something that you can do once and then be done with, right? But there are ways to meet accessibility requirements by meeting, for instance, the, the WCAG gu guidelines or other sets of guidelines and explaining how the work that you're um, publishing or the device that you're um, producing can sort of uh, interact with these guidelines. And then that gives everybody kind of good guideposts for what to go by. Um, it isn't, it isn't true that someone could just make a device and then therefore that makes your thing illegal. Um, yeah, is there a specific case? Excuse me, that's a real life example. When the iPad was introduced, Steve Jobs turned Flash off. And then what used to be legal was not working on those devices. So it was an after the fact kind of thing. Yeah. All right, well, there's a specific case. I didn't actually know about that one. I um, mean, I knew they turned flash off, but I didn't realize that it had a case. Right. Okay, so if you're going to talk, you have to use the mic for our, our, uh, our audience outside. So did you want to say something? I was going to make two points regarding that. So one, a lot of other mobile devices don't do well with flash to begin with. So in some cases, we're talking about maybe it's not so much an Apple thing, but it's a legacy technology issue because now everything is migrating away from Flash. You know, it's kind of like saying that, well, I've got all these DVDs and now no company is making DVD players on their, you know, on their computers. And so, you know, the format doesn't work anymore. I mean, I think, I think there's a degree that there's, this is a, a tech issue and you know, not even just from an accessibility standpoint, but from a consumer standpoint, that those are the largest growing markets of tools that that students might be consuming this information with. Certainly simpler is always better, right? <laughs> Follow up? Just one final thing. Yes, Flash technically is not supportive of how people were getting around that. They were turning captions on while they were making their flash, therefore the captions were given were displaying to everyone in the flash sir, flash version, therefore meeting accessibility requirements. And the second those iPads came out, that wasn't an option. Yeah, well, different. I mean, Flash is produced by a proprietary company that has its own relationship to accessibility that's not always perfect. So it's, it's definitely a moving target. Um, 
So, uh, you know, certainly uh, keeping, trying not to uh, use uh, proprietary technologies in order to build your materials is sometimes the best choice too, because then you're beholden to those proprietary technologies. We were talking about that a little bit over here, yeah. So, so typically, uh, and I'm happy to be corrected because, again, you're a room full of experts who overshadows me in many ways. Um, typically, I would believe that those things would only come into play if user-identifiable user information were being passed back and forth. So in an environment where there's, like, read-only activity going on, typically I wouldn't think that that would come into play. Now, if it's an activity that asks the user to create an identity and then have some sort of interaction with it, then it comes into play, right? So uh, almost, I mean, we're, we now live in this world, anybody, everybody who's an instructional designer here, obviously, and librarians do, and people who have different hats, right? Uh, there are so many folks who are, quote, unquote, off the reservation in the sense of using applications that maybe aren't meeting uh, institutional standards for student privacy or patient privacy. Um, and so it's a problem that goes way beyond OER, I think, uh, and just kind of falls into that general problem set of, you know, wh where are the boundaries between what the institution is doing in order to protect student and, and patient privacy, and then where does the boundary fall over to the user themselves, right? So I think it's an institutional policy question, probably beyond the scope of what we can do here. <laughs> Unless somebody has a great answer for it, I'm happy to hear it. Okay, so next group then. Uh, we're up to, let's see, we did evaluate. We must be on to, are we up to manage? Has manage uh, elected a spokesperson? No? Got a pretty big group over here. No one's owning up to being a part of manage. <laughs> I see some elbow nudging going on. All right, there's a mic coming on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we tried to distribute the objectives so we could hit more than one. So I'll, I'll speak to one of them and maybe the other people in the group would like to speak to theirs. So uh, the one that I researched is item 11. I believe that's right. Yes, demonstrate an awareness of issues relating to rights of others. <clears throat> and so I did find a podcast on... Uh, the OER Commons that explains uh, very nicely an overview. There you go. Great. And so, um, did you, uh, you, know, you obviously felt this was relevant to your learning outcome, right? Mm -hmm. What about the licensing? Did you spend time investigating the licensing? I did not. So let's take a quick look. And Allison, I don't know if you want to speak to this, but with OER Commons, right, um, sort of like with Merlot, wouldn't, one wouldn't necessarily want to just stay within OER Commons in one's evaluation. One would want to go directly to the work itself and examine things there, right? So it's part of a, <clears throat> excuse me, part of a course website. Yeah, so there's kind of a trail here, right, where this uh, resource, oop. oops. I'm forbidden, oh, well, we just answered it, I'm forbidden. <laughs> Is this openly licensed? Forbidden. So I was just seeing that it was uh, part of this uh, US UCF uh, course, and so I was trying to, get all the way to being able to evaluate the course itself. So it looks like we've got like a, a series of republications here that might uh, might take some sleuthing to actually get at the original author and the licensing that was under it, right? Um, and so this is maybe an illustration of something that, uh, that you, you just, again, just because something comes up in a search or is included in a repository 
with an indication that there's an open license behind it. It may take extra levels of work in order to verify that that's true. Right. What about uh, production quality, accessibility, interactivity? Do those things come up in your uh, your evaluation of this work? No. I'm sorry. Okay, well, one other thing that we wanted to do today was actually get to the point where we were adding some resources to the work itself. And so uh, if another group would like to go through the process of, of uh, evaluating a resource, happy to do that. But if not, I think we should probably, in the interest of time, turn it over to our next stage. Is there a group that wants to talk about a resource that they uncovered that hasn't yet? Yes. I just actually had a question because uh, we split up the learning outcome, so I chose number two. And uh, MIT has open courses. They did have the Creative Commons license, but they had a comment that said non-commercial share alike, mm -hmm. and with an explanation of it. But I didn't copy that part. So what? So it, and it said, do you have to repost what you did then? No. So the um, the. So non-commercial share alike are Creative Commons um, sort of, you know, uh, components of the license, right? So that's the NCSA part of a Creative Commons license if somebody's chosen that. So what that means is not that you're forced to share it, but that if you do share it, you have to share your work if you've modified it under the same license. So I would post it back where I got the original. Yeah, you don't have to. But so if you take a resource that's licensed with a share alike license, and you make some changes to it and publish it or start to use it, you have to change, uh, publish it using the same license that the original work was published under. Does that make sense? Creative Commons, because it's like a five chapter course. So yeah, so. Material. So if I shorten it or use. Yeah, so for example, yeah, you might shorten it and then if you were gonna start using it and teaching it, say you put it in your website or started using it in your institution, you'd wanna carry through that exact same license. That's what the share alike means. Okay. That makes sense? Um, and so just a word of, of caution on, so MIT OpenCourseWare is famous for being you know, one of the first large institutional moves into OER. Um, and anything, a lot of the material that is produced by OIT, <laughs> OpenCourseWare, is openly licensed, so a lot of the lecture captures and things like that. But a lot of the underlying course materials for those courses are not openly licensed. So what you may find in MIT is a course where the videos were captured at MIT of an MIT faculty member giving lectures, and those are openly licensed, but the underlying textbook for the course is not openly licensed. So just because part of the course is open doesn't mean that all the materials for the course are open. Or you may find a course where the syllabus is openly licensed but not some of the other materials or something like that. So again, it does take a little bit of sleuthing to look all the way through all the components. Yeah. Just to, following up on what you're saying, I think with licenses you need to look both ways. So if you are, first of all, a Creative Commons license is a license in perpetuity. You can't take it back. Um, secondly, um, I shouldn't say perpetuity, I should say life of the copyright, um, which is a long time, your life plus 70 years. Secondly, if you have um, a commercial license, um, it means you are allowing other people to use your work for commercial gain, but there's no requirement for, their, for them to share their gain with you. Um, it does allow other people to use the work they made commercially as well too, but that's now three steps beyond what you did. So I'm just suggesting that you look at all the licenses. Furthermore, if you allow, if you sign a share-alike license, you need the authority to do so. You need to make sure that your institution will allow your work to be shared. You don't, although as faculty, we think we own everything we do. I own it. I wrote it. It's not always true. And so you need to check with your institution to make sure you have the right to share. So I would just check the licenses going back, what are you getting? And going forward, who might use your work and in what way according to the license that you've signed or according to your understanding of the license that you've signed. And then the last thing I think is that a derivative work under copyright law is not the way they're using it here. The way they're using it here means that you can make changes going forward but for copyright law, derivative work would mean even using a whole work in a new way 
you need permission to do that. So I'm assuming that what they mean here is that you can make changes to the work going forward, which is not quite what the copyright law means. Yeah, so again, so the, just depend. a cautionary word, you want to look both ways, I think, before you take a Creative Commons license. Um, it's just as easy. I'm not speaking against Creative Commons. I think it's a wonderful resource. But you can also write your own license in just two sentences. Yeah, the nice thing about uh, using a Creative Commons license is there's a whole world of community of people already using them that have lawyers that have already written the licenses, and so you, it's a, a much easier um, system to sort of adopt. And then everybody who sees that you've adopted a Creative Commons license can understand what that means, uh, at least if they've taken the time to learn it. The Creative Commons website itself has pretty good tools around choosing open licenses. So if you ever want to publish something under an open license, going to the creativecommons.org website is a good way to sort of um, learn about which license. Uh, they even have a wizard that asks you some questions and uh, suggests a license based on your answer to those questions. Um, wait, sure. One of the things about uh, this was MIT, and I don't know if people are aware that MIT's videotape videos of their courses last year they got sued, and uh, for accessibility issues, closing the loop on accessibilities that they don't caption their videos. I don't know that we'll close the loop on accessibility. It, well, it's closing the loop for this, so they're <laughs> getting sued, and uh, they were hoping that the judge would throw out the suit and say there's no merit to it. Two weeks ago, the judge said, oh, yeah, there's lots of merit to this, and it is moving forward. So if somebody's using these Creative Commons MIT licenses as part of what they're doing, when eventually a judge rules on this, and it's very probable that the judge will say, uh-uh, you can't do this anymore, the whole trail down the line is dead at that point because well, they'll be taking them down. It, it's not necessarily dead because it could be addressed. Well, they could, no, the transcript, no, they have to be captioned. That's what the whole lawsuit is about. And MIT is digging in their heels and saying, no, we're not captioning. Right, but if they've given an open license that allows somebody else to caption somebody them, else then could somebody else could caption, caption them. them. Yeah, but MIT is yeah. not going to do it. Right. Yeah, MIT will only go so far. So we probably won't solve all the accessibility and legal concerns here in this workshop, although I'd love to <laughs> if we could. Um, so let's... Uh, one of our dreams when we first uh, hatched up the idea of this uh, workshop was to gather this group of people together and actually get to the point where we were we together had collaboratively contributed to make this information literacy user's guide a richer work, right? So we're going to try to get to that stage here yet this afternoon before we leave. So uh, in the this sort of uh, rearticulated collaborative edition of the original work, uh, as Allison pointed out before, we have chapters built up for each of the each of the kind of uh, seven pillars, and the um, I'm going to put this up here so I can see it. Um, the seven pillars and the uh, the additional areas um, around science literacy, visual literacy, uh, instructors' materials. So. Uh, each of you actually now has full edi editorial control over this work. Uh, you just don't know how to do it. <laughs> uh, and so unless, unless, of course, you didn't actually fill out that survey, um, and oh, uh, if you didn't fill out that survey and want to participate in this part, uh, let me know, and I'll get you added in. Um, but everybody else who filled out the survey we made a, a username and a login for you to get in and, and start making adjustments to this work and adding materials to it. So I want to I want to show you a couple things about how to do that before we get started. And so I think the right thing to do here would be a little bit like in our, our uh, walkthrough of evaluating different resources would be to pick say one resource or a couple of resources that you or your group feel um, kind of meet at least the minimum. Uh, qualifications for being included in a work like this. And remember, even if the licensing is a little bit in question, uh, you could still produce an openly licensed work that linked to or embedded some other work that where the open licensing wasn't, was a little bit in question. So for instance, like that Goodwill Industries page could be linked to from a page that explains to users of this work why it was relevant and useful to them, right? 
So just because it doesn't have a, a clear open license on the other side doesn't mean it couldn't be added to the work. So um, be thinking about what resource you might want to add and, uh, and also you might want to think about maybe in the context of today adding a smaller resource because then it will take less time, <laughs> right? So I'm going to uh, kind of walk you through some of the things to be thinking about uh, as you do that. So I've come to the home page of this course, which is available again off that, that one web page that at lumenlearning.com slash OST that we started from. Uh, and so this is the table of contents for the Information Literacy Users Guide. And so when you get to this home page, uh, if you're not already logged in, you'll see a button in the upper right that says log in, and you'll be able to do that. Um, and I'll tell you how to do that in just a second with a username and a password. Um, but in order to keep your attention for a couple seconds before you go, start going crazy editing, I'm going to just point out a couple things about doing that yourself. So I'm going to navigate in to an existing page that Allison actually added to this course uh, that she showed you before that is just a simply embedded video and she's taken care to make the right open licensing attribution for it. So I just want to show you quickly how she went about that. So as you bring your works in, you can also take care to add the open licensing information that you need to add that you found in your discovery process, right? So uh, this is a relatively straightforward page. All she did was embed a video, and that was the simplest thing in the world. This video happened to come from YouTube, I think. Um, and so all she needed to do to embed this video was know the URL of the video, and she could just paste it in here, and it would automatically embed. You'll see I'm already logged in, so I have this edit button over here. And so because I'm already logged in, as you soon will be, I can just go through and edit this page. Anybody recognize the user interface here? WordPress, right. So underneath the hood, this platform is WordPress oriented. So if you've ever worked in WordPress, which as the blogging platform, uh, it should be relatively straightforward for you. Uh, this is a... Um, uh, implementation of WordPress that several educational institutions have gotten together in order to turn into an open resource publishing platform. So it has extra capabilities built into it that do a variety of different things, including making it possible to track open licensing and um, embed it into learning management systems like Blackboard or Angel um, or other learning management systems like that uh, so that it can be delivered to students right in the environment that they, that they use it. And you'll see that all that Allison did was paste in a single URL to that video, and it automatically became embedded in the site. And that's something that WordPress does, uh, which is pretty handy. And there are ways to embed things that don't do that automatically as well. Um, one can also just cut and paste text into this environment for anybody who's done that. And so if you're just working with a, a textual uh, a piece of text, you can easily just copy and paste text into here as well. For those of you who like to look a little bit deeper at code, you can flip over to the text mode and it will show you uh, a, a deeper level of the HTML code too, but you don't need to do that. You can just stay in the visual mode and just work in it just like it was Microsoft Word, except it's a little simpler. So getting the material in there, and we're happy to bop around and help with you guys. Uh, Allison has edited 47,000 different books in, <laughs> in a platform like this, so she knows all about it, and I'm pretty handy in it as well, so we can answer specific questions. So once you've gotten your um, uh, material in here, uh, you then want to make sure that you've recorded the open license for it. And if you scroll down on the page here, you'll see a citations area, and you can see how... Allison has recorded the um, bare minimum of information that's necessary to make uh, a good uh, licensing attribution, right? She's uh, given a title to the component of the page that this open license is for, or this license, it doesn't, it isn't always open, right? And so in this case, right, you might have several components on a page that come from different sources, and so you may be adding more than one citation to a page. In this case, she only has one, so she's given it a clear title, and then she's recorded the original author of the work. In this case, it's a library. And then maybe most importantly, she's provided a URL that gets back to the original source. That's, you know, having a good title and a clear URL that get back to the original source are some of the most important things because then anybody who's using the work can then go back to the original source, hopefully, if it's still alive, and... Um, and look at it there. And then you can pick 
uh, an open license or other licensing situation from this drop-down list. And you'll notice all the Creative Commons ones are listed there. Um, sometimes you may also be including, say, a YouTube video that still is copyrighted. And so you would choose all rights reserved. YouTube videos make themselves embeddable, though, so it's okay to embed it even though it's a copyrighted work. So you can make a, a recording of the license there. And then uh, in order for your license to actually appear on the page, you've got to select a citation uh, type. And in most cases, you're going to be picking something like, you know, CC license content shared previously, meaning somebody openly licensed this and published it somewhere else, and I'm bringing it into a new environment, right? But there are other choices there as well. So your two goals are to um, come into this environment, and if you go to the organize area, you'll see the complete table of contents of the entire work, and you can add a new page to any chapter. So for instance, if you're in the gather group, you, can, you guys could add five different pages, and each one of you could be adding a different thing, or you could um, work on one page. Only one user can work on a single page at a time, but multiple users can be working on multiple pages at the same time. Right? So um, you can come in, add as many pages as you want or need to. You could even go in and modify the existing work. So for instance, if you felt that uh, you had found a video that would be especially uh, useful embedded in the already existing text, you could do that. Um, we were sort of anticipating that this would be more of an environment where we're adding ancillary materials and extra materials. Um, but it's not like you're going to break anything because a revision of every page is saved in the system uh, automatically. So if you make uh, an intervention and we need to pull it back out, we can do that. Um, or you can do it too. Uh, so when you actually uh, go through this process of adding a page, putting some information in it, remember to hit this red button on the right or your work, work will not be actually published out. It does do auto saves every so often, so it won't necessarily erase, but it won't be published until you hit that button, right? So you're gonna go put some work in there. You're gonna make sure that you put your citation in for the copyright situation for that work. Uh, and then we're gonna see at the end of the day if we've actually made this a better work or not. So uh, here's how you're gonna log in. So again, you're, you can get to all these things from this, uh, the home page for this uh, workshop here, and you'll see the uh, Information Literacy User's Guide Collaborative Edition link right here. If you click on that, it will take you to the home page, and you will either see, like I do, an already logged in situation, Or when you get there, it'll probably look more like this, right, with the login button. And so you'll hit that button, and you will enter your username and password. And those are going to be really simple because your username is everything in front of the at sign in your email address, except if you have dots or dashes or anything weird in your email name, then those have been removed and it's just letters. So if my email name uh, address is nate at lumenlearning.com, my username is nate. If your uh, e uh, email is nate.angel, then it's going to be nateangel, right? And your password is going to be change me, all lowercase, all one word. And that is a hint to you that when you actually do log in, and I'm using my handy password manager to log in because I'm lazy and secure, sort of, you can come up here to the upper right corner and your name will your username will be up there, and you can edit your profile and make a new password for yourself. It will try to force you to use a very long, hard to remember password. You can change it to Bella, which is your dog's name, if you want, but you just have to check the box that you're okay using a weak password. Anybody here got a dog named Bella? 47% of all dogs in the United States are named Bella. <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> well, so far, I think in every time I've done this, somebody in the audience has had a dog named Bella. But I know it's crazy. I'm a cat person, so I'm, a, I'm exempt. Uh, 
Okay, so if anybody has any trouble logging in, uh, raise your hand and we'll come help you out. If anybody has any trouble figuring out how to move their work over, raise your hand and we'll come help you out. If anybody has any trouble figuring out how to record the, the licensing situation of their work, raise your hand and we'll come help you out. Go. <laughs> At 5.15, I mean, I don't think they're going to kick us out or anything. Um, but uh, what I'm going to do now is the surprise reveal of this little color-coded bars for Eric's username. No. Uh, let's go back to the home page for the course itself and see if it has any new pages published in it. Ooh, I think I see a new page here. Would someone, there's a few new pages here, yeah. Would someone like to take credit for um, practice evaluating a web page? <laughs> it's, a, it's a short page. And the first thing I noticed about it is it doesn't have any licensing attribution on it. Ah, excellent. Good, yeah, it's a work in progress, okay. <laughs> oh, this is a new one, I like this, empowering yourself as a digital citizen. And so uh, this looks like an awesome page, and I noticed that it has an open licensing attribution in there. It looks to me like it might just be pasted in the body of the work, which is okay. Um, is there, are there any librarians still in the room? There's only one, oh, two, three librarians? Okay, there's a whole row of librarians. Uh, it would even be better if the open licensing were recorded in the metadata and down under the citations. So I'll just do that in front of you so you can see, right? Did you add this page? No? You were, you were looking at me and nodding, so. Ah, over here, okay. I'm gonna turn my attention this way then. So I'll go in to edit the page and maybe you're still in there. Nope, you're not. Otherwise it would have said, do you wanna take control of this page? And presuming that you got the license right there, which probably pasted it in from the source, right? So so that's a CC by uh, non-commercial, right? So attribution, non-commercial license, right? And this URL right here is the original source of it? Yeah. All right. So I'm gonna copy that link, and then I'm gonna come down to the citations area, and I'm gonna say that it's Creative Commons license shared previously, I'm gonna paste that URL in. And then I'm actually gonna go look at it to see if, uh, yep, there's that nice title that you already gave to your page, so I'll use that. Put that into the descrip description. So if you added something else to this page, like, oh, then maybe later you found this awesome YouTube video, you'd want to add another citation for that video with its separate licensing information, right? So that's why it's important to have the a description in there so you can tell them apart. And then do you already have some sort of record of the author? <laughs> wait, wait, you actually wrote this? Oh, okay. Nice. And so would I, uh, I'm looking on this to see if I can attribute it to somebody, somebody or some organization specifically. Maybe I'll look in the syllabus. I would love to find, I don't want to give it to Instructor.
Oh, it's part of this media literacy project, right? So, I mean, one thing about this, uh, just from a licensing perspective, it carries an attribution license on it, but it's difficult to know who to attribute it to, right? So something to think about putting on your into the resource. So maybe I'll uh, I'll attribute it to this. Uh, doesn't media li oh, meta literacy? Sorry, I said media literacy. Don't you guys have your own Twitter account? No. Why you don't have a Twitter account? Oh, I spelled it wrong. User error. There we go. So I'm going to attribute it to your Twitter account, just as a as a first stage. So then, I actually have a page, and I'll update that to make sure it saves, and then I'll go view it, and now. That attribution is in the metadata. So we don't need it in both places, so it could be cleaned out, but that makes sense? All right, so we actually have more than one added resource to this page. So congratulations, people. You, you made this a better open work. Now, since you all have continuing editing rights over this collaborative edition, I expect to see it expand over time as well. And since we have all your email addresses, maybe we'll contact you and niggle you every once in a while. <laughs> and then we're also going to sell them for a profit to some company. So if you get any spam in the future, you can blame us. You have the so closing remarks? Good? Yeah, we're good. All right. Thank you very much, Allison and Nate. Um, that was awesome. Thank you very much, um, all of you also. Um, I do have a few announcements that I want to make. Number one, you guys are here at the end of the day, so you all have earned your fabulous badge. Um, and I wanted to show you. Uh, do you want to plug yours in or do you want to? Yeah, can you put this one in? So if you guys go to bit.ly slash Coat Summit Workshop, you can collect your Credly Workshop badge. And, um, and I hope that you will. And I hope that you will also share that either in Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn. You can actually put it on your LinkedIn profile. And um, I want to call out to Steve Race, who's here. Um, I don't think you were here this morning um, when I was recognizing everyone, but Steve Race is the one who is assisting us. Bit.ly. I just got it myself with that thing. So Is it up there? Bit.ly slash coat all caps summit workshop and it's summit workshop is lowercase did it work okay so i want to show you some of the badges that we're giving out um at the summit uh uh today and over the course of the next three days we have the cool summit badge, and then the workshop badge is that one in the middle. The effective practice winners will earn the effective practices badge. Any speakers or panelists will earn the speaker badge. And um, up in the right-hand corner is the um, ambassador badge, which we'll be giving out tomorrow. Now, I wanted to um, tell you that um, you know groups can plan to go out and cohort for dinner on the uh, conference webpage under uh, location there's a list of restaurants that are recommended and in the in, near to the hotel in the area so um, you guys can uh, uh, meet in the lobby um, to see who else wants to go out to dinner and go and have dinner with, uh, with a group of people that you may not know but that you might want to know and get um, uh, to know and, and uh, have a good um, conversation and good meal with. I also wanted to mention Tomorrow, breakfast is at 8 o'clock in the morning from 8 to 9. We'll, we'll start back up with the conference at 9 a.m. Um, we have a full, wonderful day planned tomorrow. Um, we have um, uh, Carla Casilli. Are you still here, Carla? Her, her stuff is here. But um, Carla is going to be um, talking about making sense uh, of the new world of digital credentialing. 
Um, Alicia Fernandez, is she here? Uh, she is an award, our award-winning Open SUNY student, and she's the recipient of the uh, 2015 um, National University Technology Network uh, Online Student Award. And if you were not aware that there are online student awards, I would like to make you aware of that. And Alicia, you will meet her. She is the recipient of that award last year. She was my student at UAlbany, and I nominated her, and she won for that. Um, and she's going to be talking about her lessons learned after completing 28 online courses. Um, she has earned three credentials online, and she's an amazing person. I can't wait for you to meet her. Um, now, the wonderful thing that happened today is for the first time in 17 years, I lost a presenter. Um, and unfortunately, Paula Blanc from Southern New Hampshire University um, came down with a stomach virus. And um, this morning, while we were, um, uh, you know, deep into all of the conversations that we were having this morning, I was frantically with him trying to figure out what we were going to do about our keynote tomorrow. And he, amazingly, in spite of being very sick at the moment, um, and he sends his regrets and his regards to everyone, um, helped uh, to identify uh, Michelle Weiss, uh, um, who will be joining us tomorrow. She is the executive director of Sandbox Collaborative, uh, and she is um, formerly um, from the Clayton Institute. And um, if you go on the blog, I already have her picture and her bio, and her presentation is going to be, um, uh, let me tell you, her presentation is going to be high, Higher Education, the Disruptive Potential of Online Competency-Based Education. Um, so I'm very excited uh, to meet her and to see her presentation tomorrow. We'll also have our annual um, UN session. Uh, so come prepare tomorrow to um, share something uh, that's cool and that you are doing on your campus. If you... Um, um, you know, don't come up and talk. I will, uh, you know, point to you and make you come up. Uh, and I'll go over it. For those of you who aren't familiar with the UN session, I'll go over it with you tomorrow. But come prepared to uh, share some links or talk about something cool and innovative that's going on on your campus. Daniel Greenstein is going to be here talking. He's from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. His presentation is Solution for a New Majority. And tomorrow afternoon, we're closing the day with um, Peter Shea, who's not here, uh, to moderating our online teaching ambassadors panel. And we will be recognizing the 2016 online teaching ambassadors tomorrow. So we'll be talking uh, more about the research that we're doing uh, as well as introducing you to the new uh, group of online teaching ambassadors and to that program, if you're not familiar with it. Um, I'll, I'll talk with you about how you, you can nominate faculty from your campus for this program. And hopefully you will also um, uh, be interested in earning some of the badges. I don't have the social media badges up there, but there's a number of them. I hear there's quite a competition going for some of those uh, for some of those social media badges going. So, uh, so good. I think that is all I have. Does anyone have any questions? Are we gonna? We're gonna have a great evening. Yes. Successfully posted. We have a winner. <laughs> yeah, I got your badge. I got your badge right here. Um, okay. Uh, so without, you know, if no one else has any questions, then let's go have a, a wonderful dinner, and I'll see you at eight o'clock in the morning. Thank you, everybody.